So in these bone beds, which as you look down at them, and there's lots of open bone beds that you can view as you walk through the park, as you look in there, you see just piles of bones. And what happened was, as animals became trapped in this tarry goo, let's say something like a mammoth, scavengers would come along to feed on it and become trapped in the tarry goo. And scavengers would come by to feed on them and become trapped in the tarry goo. So you just have this, you know, so the equivalent of an early L.A. traffic jam, just a pile up <laughs> of dead animals forming in these tar pits. Well, the other great benefit is this tar is an incredible preservative. So while it takes a lot of work to clean it off, the bones underneath are exquisitely preserved. So there's hundreds of beautiful skulls of saber-toothed cats and of dire wolves and full skeletons of mammoths and mastodon. So unlike what happens when, say, a dinosaur gets washed down a river and it's all broken to pieces, these things were preserved as they fell. So spectacular intact fossils. So on the next visit to L.A., I highly recommend a visit to the La Brea Tar Pits. So what do these specimens from the fossil record tell us? Well, they tell us four main ideas. First of all, undoubtedly, that animal and plant forms have changed over time. Secondly, the time span of evolution is immense. I've shown you just the animal record spanning more than 500 million years. But also, most of this stuff that I'm showing you is not around at all, not around anymore. So extinction is the fate of most species that have ever existed. Biologists estimate perhaps 99.9% of all species that ever existed are extinct. And environments in every locale have changed, often drastically so. Those Burgess shale creatures I showed you, those were marine animals now found above the tree line in British Columbia. Those palm trees, of course, look nothing like the current landscape. So environments change. And one of the main messages, the reason I want to tell you so much about Darwin's geological observations and and the fossil record, is that living things are occupying a planet whose surface is always changing. Hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes, tectonic movement, ice ages, climate changes, whether local or global, all of these keep changing the environments that species are in. They are running to keep up, and most of the time, they fail. So we have to think about Earth history to understand life's history. We have to understand what's going on in any particular place to appreciate what's going on with any particular species. So the record tells us that evolution has happened, but the main question Darwin wanted to address was how, and this is the second big idea. The second big idea is natural selection. And I'm going to tell you the, a whole chunk of code here from The Origin of Species. It contains every element, every ingredient necessary for natural selection to work, as well as the clearest definition of the process. Darwin says, Can it then be thought improbable that other variations useful in some way to each being in the great and complex battle of life should sometimes occur in the course of thousands of generations? If such do occur, can we doubt, remembering that many more individuals are born than can possibly survive, that individuals having any advantage, however slight, over others, would have the best chance of surviving and appropriating their kind. On the other hand, we may feel sure that any variation in the least degree injurious would be rigidly destroyed. This preservation of favorable variations and the rejection of injurious variations, I call natural selection. Two sides to the coin. The rejection of things that are less favorable and the preservation of those things that are more favorable. So... What are these ingredients? Well, if we look at, the, at Darwin's quote, he's saying variation, there in red, thousands of generations, time, and advantage. He means selective advantage. So these are the three ingredients. This is the fuel of evolution, variation, selection, and time. If you want to think of it, think of any process that produces a product. You usually have raw material, some work, over time. The raw material is variation, selection does the work, and time, it takes a various amounts of time for the process to happen. So to illustrate this process of natural selection, I want to give you just one example, sort of a modern example, but it, it illustrates all the features that I want to tell you about of, of seeing these ingredients of evolution. And we're going to think about the adaptation of a rarely modest, humble species to a changing landscape. What I'm showing you here is a lava flow across part of the desert in the American Southwest. Over the last couple of million years, there have been eruptions that have led to, lava, to uh, lava flows. When that lava cools, it forms these black rock formations on this general background of sort of sandy, dry soil. And in this habitat lives 
the humble rock pocket mouse. And that rock pocket mouse occurs in two varieties, a sandy colored mouse and a dark colored mouse. And I'm showing you these animals on different colored backgrounds. And the sandy mouse that matches well to the sandy colored rock, the dark mouse that matches well to the dark colored rock, and then you can see the mismatch when either the dark mouse is on light rock or the light colored version is on dark rock. And it matters. This color matching really matters with respect to predators. And let me just explain to you a little bit about color matching in mice with a short video. So when that dark mouse finds itself on light colored habitat, <laughs> it can be in big trouble. Its natural predators are owls. But of course, if we change the backdrop, the dark mouse blends in well, but the light colored mouse He's in trouble. So we now know a lot about the ecology, about the genetics, and about the evolution of this pattern. And that's what I want to tell you. The rock pocket mouse inhabits these, these lava flows and the surrounding rocks, and this color matching is important to its survival. Well, there's two forms of the mouse. It's all the same species, and that, those two forms are determined by genetic variation. There's a single gene that we'll abbreviate here called MC1R, that comes in two alternative versions, or alleles. And sandy-colored mice have two copies of the light allele for this gene. And the dark mice have either one copy or two copies of the dark allele. So scientists at the University of Arizona have pinpointed the exact genetic basis for the, color, the fur color difference between the two populations of mice. Now, let's consider how long might it take for a black mouse to arise in a sandy colored population. If that lava flow has happened, how long would it take? Is it, is it, can natural selection really do the job to allow a population of mice to adapt to a new landform, in this case, lava rock? Well, the ingredients there have to do with the interplay between variation and time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through the variables and I'm going to walk you through crunching a little bit of the numbers. And rather than take notes, I'm just going to urge you to just follow along or look up Watch the, watch the board, whatever. Don't worry about the numbers. We can always go over them again later. But just follow along the logic of, of crunching the numbers of how these ingredients of evolution interact. So to know how often a black coat mutation can arise, that's going to depend upon three things. The mutation rate, the reproduction rate in these mice, and the population size. How many mice are there? How often are they reproducing? Well, we know a lot about the mutation rate from decades of study. And the mutation rate in mice is about two mutations per billion sites in DNA. So DNA copying is highly accurate, but not perfect. And if it was perfect, there would be no evolution. We need variation for the fuel of evolution to work. There are about 10 sites in the MC1R gene that can be mutated to cause this black type of appearance. And there's two copies of the MC1R gene in every mouse. If we multiply all those together, what we come up with is one in 25 million mice baby mice, will have a black coat mutation. One in 25 million. Well, geez, you know, does that mean one in 25 million? Is that a long shot? Does that mean that I can't see how this evolution would work? Not at all, because now we have to introduce some other factors. And those other factors are the reproductive rate and the population size. So each female in this population is having at least five babies, at least five babies a year. And in an average population, there's about 5,000 females. So there are about 25,000 pocket mice being born a year in this population. Now, if we multiply 25,000 babies times 1 in 25 million, that means every 1,000 years, there will be spontaneously a black mouse born to sandy-colored parents. 1 in 1,000 years. Now let's put it in a geological framework. Those lava flows I'm showing you, some are 1.7 million years old. So this mutation could have arisen 1,700 times independently. Plenty of time for the raw material to arise 1,700 times over. OK, so how does this black coloration actually spread through the population? Well, that's selection's job. How long does it take for every mouse to become black? And now we have to figure